Hey, welcome back. It's me. It's Chris. I'm in the cellar at Second Glass. It's Cellar Chats, the weekly wine flights. Um, sorry, I hit live and my nose just decided that it was going to be itchy because uh, I don't know if you guys are out and about today, but it feels like there's, I'm pretty sure there's ash falling. I don't know where it's coming from. I'm assuming it's a controlled burn, but either way, there's ash falling. The pollen is terrible, but what else is new? Um, this week, we are off to the Sierra Foothills. That's right, going to California, and we're talking the Sierra Foothills ABA. If you guys are not familiar with where that is, um, basically it's exactly what it is. It's the foothills of the Sierra Mountains. Um, as you move east through California towards Nevada, basically you would get to the Sierra Foothills, and if you keep going, you're gonna get to the Sierra Mountains, where you'll find yourself in Yosemite National Park, and if you keep going a little bit further, you'll find yourself in Nevada. Um, exactly where the Sierra Foothills ABA is, is basically due east of Sacramento, um, is kind of like the northern edge of it, and it runs all the way down um, about as far south as um, about where Santa Cruz is, maybe a little bit further than that, but if you can picture kind of the Bay Area, directly east is essentially like the center of the Sierra Foothills uh, region. Really cool appellation in California, and one of those ones that has, again, like so many regions that are not Napa and Sonoma, have been overlooked for many years, but there's a long, long history of growing grapes here. It's an amazing uh, set of soils. It's known for like highly granite soils. Again, we are in the mountains. So you find a lot of like Rhone varieties and other things like that, but then you also find Zinfandel and Cabernet and essentially a whole plethora of things. So it's a pretty wild place, um, but it's also become kind of like Amador count, or sorry, not Amador, because that's part of the Sierra Foothills. Um, it's become a lot like the Lodi and Mendocino and places like this where a lot of the young growers are looking to this area because you can get really great fruit um, and from really amazing sites farmed really well without paying Napa Sonoma prices. So who doesn't like that? All right, so this week we're gonna kick it off with a little Terre Rouge, uh, a legendary producer in that area. I actually just had uh, their national sales rep, Les Doss, in town yesterday. Um, so maybe you got some of you who tune into this came out to our event last night. If you did, thank you very much. Um, but these wines have always been amazing. Celeste has always enjoyed these wines. So it was fun to bring this back in. She used to run it by the glass a while back. Um, and then we're going to do Michael Cruz, their Chardonnay, which comes from the Sierra Foothills from the Rourke Vineyard. And then rounding it out with Painted Fields, probably the most, um, I will say most recently established winery um, in this lineup. We're kind of going, as far as I know, I couldn't find the exact established date for Painted Fields, but I know it's a relatively new project. Um, so let's get into it. Again, starting out, Terre Rouge there. Sorry, it's a little glary here. Terre Rouge Viognier. This is from their Fiddletown Vineyard. Um, Fiddletown is a sub-AVA of the Sierra Foothills. So Terre Rouge was founded by Bill Easton and his wife back in, I want to say, whew, uh, late, maybe in the 80s. I want to say in the 80s, might have been a little bit earlier than that, but it was probably in, somewhere in the 80s, maybe early 90s. But Bill Easton is one, one of the original Rhone Rangers, and what I mean by the Rhone Rangers are a group of winemakers in California that became for lack of a better term, obsessed with Rhone varieties, Syrah, Viognier, Marsan, Roussan, Grenache, all of these things. And it was a group of guys and they were, you know, basically labeled as the Rhone Rangers. There was an article written, I can't remember where it was, but that's what their label was given. And it, it consisted of Bill Easton, um, Randall Graham, who founded Bonnie Dune and most recently sold it a few years ago. Um, I think, I'm trying to think of some of the other guys that were in that group. Um, Many of them sadly have passed away or have sold their wineries, but it was about six guys, I think, in total. Um, and there's a couple that weren't originally part of that original list, but really are considered part of the original Rome Rangers. Anyways, that's a whole other subject for another time. Um, but Bill Easton has been up here as long as just about anybody as far as like modern time is you know, concerned, championing Syrah and Grenache and Viognier, which is had a really bumpy history in California. Oftentimes it's made in a style that is trying to be more like big oaky Chardonnay, which is not really a pleasant thing for Viognier. I mean, I'm sure it's very delicious to a lot of people, but it's not what Viognier is all about. Bill is obsessed with the Northern Rhone, hence his Viognier and um, Syrah ties. 
Viognier most famously from Condrieu. Um, and this is what he kind of like, he, I wouldn't say he makes his Viognier in the image of, but that's his inspiration is Condrieu. So these like really stony, but also floral and lifted complex wines made from Viognier. And one of the things about Viognier is that in all Northern Rhone uh, white grapes is that they really need time and bottle to really show their best. Um, and Bill does one of the most interesting things, and, and I'm going a little bit deep on this because I think what he does is fascinating, which is he bottle ages everything before it's released. So this is a 2019 vintage. That is the current release. To give you a frame of reference, the Chardonnay from Michael Cruz is 21. That's pretty normal for white wines right now. Current release 21, some 22, depending on the style. The red that we're going to have is also 21 vintage. So the white is two years older than both of these other wines. And this is the current release for them. And it's just all about his philosophy and his mindset of like showcasing wines that that have basically had time to settle in bottle and develop age to where he thinks they need to be drank. Um, so on the nose, classic, little bit of honeyed character, very typical of Viognier, um, kind of honey, honeysuckle, very stony, kind of stone fruit, lemon citrus pith. Mm. Palette is pretty round. It's got some brightness. It's not heavy or dense, but there's a lot of texture complexity here that keeps it from just being super bright and simple, but it's not big, heavy, and creamy. It does go into oak, but pretty much all neutral oak. Um, and I think it does go into like concrete tank. If I, I do think I would know. I literally was talking about these wines all day yesterday. Um, Regardless, it's an excellent wine and one of those like just stellar values out on the market and has always been a fun wine to get people onto. And, you know, for summertime, if you like something that has a little more body and texture, but you don't want it to be too heavy, this Viognier will always be a great choice. Mm. Again, that is the Terre Rouge, their Fiddletown Viognier 2019 from... Um, again, Fiddletown is the sub ABA within the Sierra Foothills. All right, we're off to Cruz, Wine Co., their Rorick Vineyard Chardonnay. So this is a single vineyard Chardonnay. Um, the Rorick Vineyard is located pretty high up elevation. This comes from, if I remember correctly, fairly old plantings and a lot of own rooted fruit um, that were planted in, I want to say, maybe the 80s or 90s. So some decent decent age for own rooted fruit, particularly in California. Made by the, the master of California bubbles himself, Mr. Michael Cruz. That, that is probably a very subjective opinion, but I think he does a great job. So this is the only wine in Michael's lineup for his Cruz Wine Co. Company that is a white wine. He makes a lot of sparkling that are obviously, you know, clear Blanc wines, and then he makes some rosés, but he doesn't have any other still white wines except for this Chardonnay. And the only reason I've never asked him, and I'm not entirely sure if this would be his answer, but I'm sure it would be something akin to <clears throat> his answer to, I um, once asked him why he makes the, the wines he makes from the grapes that he makes, and he said that essentially he really likes to make wine from places that he finds to be beautiful and moving. So if he visits a vineyard and he finds the vineyard to be just an amazing place and you can tell that it's farmed well and it just has a special vibe to it, he will make wine from it regardless of what the variety is, which is how he's ended up with a lot of varieties that are not super well known. And when it comes to Chardonnay, I can't imagine he sought this out except for the fact that he knows the owner of the vineyard and he probably saw it, thought it was an amazing place to make really great wine from. And that's why he makes this wine. I'm again, don't quote me on that. That's just my guess. I can't be too far off. Or maybe I am. I don't know. Michael Cruz, at me. Tell me, tell me what's up. Um, so again, the style of this wine, really fresh, really vibrant. Um, you know, I think the Viognier and the Chardonnay could be interchangeable as far as like texture and weight. I do think the Chardonnay is going to have a little more body to it than the Viognier. I've never tasted these side by side, so I'm just guessing out loud. On the nose... <coughs> Excuse me. Pretty classic. Um, 
Chardonnay characteristics, you know, orchard fruit, pear, apple, a little bit of lemon zest. It's got a, I mean, again, we're talking high elevation granitic soils here um, in the Sierras. So it has that minerality, that vibrancy and kind of liveliness on it. Mm. Wow. It is, um, you know, it's really interesting tasting these side by side. And I don't think I would ever say this about this wine on its own. It has so much juiciness to it. Like the Viognier is really like textured and it's bright and it's fresh. Um, but the fruit notes are very subtle. Like it, it's very telltale, like stone fruit, apricot kind of thing going on. Um, but then you get into this and it's got a juicy mouthfeel while also being really bright, fresh and clean. The body is definitely kind of in the same realm as the Viognier but it stands out more that just, again, I can't get over like, it's just like basically an explosion of like juicy fruit in the best way possible. Uh, this wine is spectacular. I have really nothing else to say other than come out and please have these because they're great. Mm. Yeah, again, that is the Michael Cruz. I mean, look at that label, it's amazing. Cruz Wine Company Chardonnay, the 2021 Rorick Vineyard. All right, moving into the wine I know the least amount about, <clears throat> and I always like having wines like this on here. I like to, you know, just go into it entirely blind with really no expectations, having never tasted this wine. Um, what I do know about this winery is it's, I mean, I'm guessing it was founded maybe within the last 10 years. Um, and it's part of the, uh, the Andes Wines, which is, it was two is a winemaker and a viticulturist, I believe, or an oologist. Started this company, um, and then they hired on some young people, and then they have the consulting, very famously, Philippe Malka, who is one of the most sought after consulting winemakers, winemakers in Napa Valley. Um, he makes very expensive, very high end wines, and by very expensive, I mean things that go for a thousand dollars a bottle. Um, so he was hired on as a consulting winemaker for here. I have no idea how involved he is as a consulting winemaker, but I do know that that is always a bonus to have someone of that pedigree on your on your team. So this is their Sierra Foothills, what they call the Curse of Knowledge Cuvée, uh, and this is a really classic kind of Bordeaux style, excuse me, Bordeaux style blend. Uh, might have the breakdown in the back. Yep. <coughs> Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc Merlot, and a little bit of Petit Verdot. So, Philippe Mocha, um, if you haven't gathered, uh, is, is French. Uh, I could be wrong. Pretty sure he's French. Um, and he is known for making Bordeaux-style wines in California. Um, I do believe this might be his first and only um, project that he is consulting for, at least the one that I know of, that is in the Sierra Foothills. Almost every project he works on is in Napa and or Sonoma. Um, so it's a really, really cool project. I know they came onto the market here a couple of years ago and they've had a really good like following. People really like these wines. And this is the first time I've ever tasted them. So let's get into it. Whoo! Straight on the nose. I mean, it is California blackberry plummy fruit. It's got a little bit of like a subtle like Bordeaux-esque kind of like savoriness to it. I mean, it's not big jammy fruit only there's there's more levels to this fruit on the nose which is what i would expect from somebody of, a, of the pedigree that mr Melka is little spicy a little bit of that like cigar box kind of characteristic mm. lush kind of plush really pretty tannins very well balanced. I mean, that's a great wine. You know, it comes in at, you know, pretty typical 14.5% alcohol. That's classic for, you know, a Bordeaux wine in California. That's not weird. You don't really taste the heat. I mean, it's a little bit there, but not heavy. And you know what? I, I Going into this, I'll be fully honest, I expected it to be a little more oaky and rich and more of that, like, dense oak flavor that you find in a lot of, like, California and Napa wines and particularly like from really high-end like consulting winemakers it seems to me that like that's usually is a telltale sign um, and I, I'm pleasantly surprised that this is 
very like reserved in what I would consider the best way possible. Um, and by reserved, I mean like it's it's not overwhelmed by new oak or any kind of weird trickery. It's really well made. I mean, this wine's really spectacular. Um, and and those, I mean, I just sometimes go into things. I have no, I literally knew nothing about this wine. Um, and my bias was that like, oh, I thought it was gonna be like a lot of other things. Um, and I should have known better because Celeste isn't going to put anything on this list that isn't amazing and really well made. So uh, this one is spectacular. Well done. Uh, whole team at Painted Field. So hopefully you guys come out, have this fight. The whites are fun. They're different. I mean, the Viognier is super exciting. A grape that you probably never drink. The Chardonnay is unlike most Chardonnays. And that juice factor of like on the palate is incredible. And this is so, so tasty. And this is a perfect example of when Cabernet or Cabernet-based blends make sense in the summertime. It's got a lot of freshness, lots of texture. It still has that full-bodied character that you want from a Cabernet or a Bordeaux-style blend, but it's not overwhelming. It's not like teeth staining. It's just really fun to drink. Um, I'm a big fan. I like this. So thank you guys for tuning in as always. Get out here, support local, get some flights, get some food, have some fun. I mean, summertime, guys. Enjoy yourselves. Again, real quick wrap-up, Terre Rouge, Viognier, lovely, lovely stuff. Cruise Wine Co., Chardonnay um, from the Rourke Vineyard. Always love what Michael is doing. And then the Painted Fields. I mean, kudos, guys. Well done. Delicious. You guys will love this. Till next time. Bye.